Shunyata is one of Buddha's most important teachings, and it is one that is foundational and shared by all the different Buddhist traditions, be they Tibetan, Theravadan, Zen, or whatever, we all share this basic concept of Shunyata. Now, as I explained Shunyata initially, you may think, what's all this got to do with me? But buckle up, uh, this little monologue will take a very, very personal turn in just a few minutes after I've set up the framework to understand what Shunyata actually is. So with Shunyata, Buddha asks us to explore the question of how do things exist? What is the way that things exist? It's always important to bear that in mind. How do things exist? And to cut to the chase, Buddha said that all things and all phenomena, ourselves included, exist in dependence on other factors. There are two ways that things can exist, either dependently or independently. A dependent arising, to use the terminology, is something that exists in dependence on factors other than itself, whereas an independent thing does not exist in dependence on things, factors other than itself. So the two are quite separate. And specifically, Buddha said that all things depend on three different factors, on parts, on causes, and on mind's participation. So to give you a very uh, easy example of this, let's say that you invited me into your house for a chat, and we went down to your sitting area, and you had meant for me to sit on a chair, but unbeknownst to you, somebody had removed two legs from that chair, and the chair was now slumped in the corner. The chair is no longer a functioning chair, because for a chair to be a chair, it requires all its different parts. Imagine if somebody had actually stripped down that entire chair into all its different component pieces, you know, the legs and the upholstery and the cushions and so forth. And imagine I turned to you, your rather horrified expression, and said, oh, don't worry about those parts of the chair. Where is your actual chair? You would look at me as though I was howling at the moon mad, because I would be. Because there is no chair other than a collection of parts configured in a particular way to create a functioning thing, which is a chair. Buddha said that everything is just like this. There's no other chair, there's only a collection of parts configured in such a way to create a functioning thing. That chair also, um, or all chairs, uh, depend on causes. They come from factories, from uh, workshops. They're made by people and machines. So everything depends on dependence on causes. And similarly, everything depends on your mind's participation or your mind's engagement Remember the, the question is, how do things exist? Whether a chair is desirable or undesirable uh, depends on your mind. It's not the thing itself. And I'll give you an example. Um, when I was 17, my mum very proudly bought a pair of uh, new chairs for our sitting room. Uh, they were uh, much admired by her friends who came in to test them out. And they were made out of a fabric called Draylon, gold Draylon. I can vividly remember them. And I was of the view that they were very desirable chairs. Um, fast forward 12 months, I was at university, uh, where I met a friend who was from a very wealthy family, uh, who had a, came from a completely different background from my more modest family. And our conversation one day just happened to get onto the subject of somebody's uh, sitting room. And he was trying to remember the name of the fabric of that something was made out of, a very desirable thing. And I said to him, well, was it made from Draylon? And he looked at me as I'd made some kind of ridiculous joke, rather sneering expression, and just said, oh, Draylon is the poor man's velvet. And in those four words, the poor man's velvet, he completely transformed my view of my mother's chairs. They were no longer quite the she-she desirable objects from the smart departmental store. They were rather something to be kept a bit quiet about, perhaps. So the way that those chairs exist, how they existed for me, shifted as a result of a single conversation. Everything therefore depends on parts, on causes, and on mind's participation or mind's projection is another synonym used for that. And where this gets very, very personal is that Buddha said that we exist on the same basis too. That is, dependent on parts, on causes, and on mind's participation. So, if you look at it, the most basic thing, parts, there are so many ways that you can slice and dice how I am, but the most basic is that I have a mind and I have a body. Um, 
and how I am, the way that I exist for myself, depends on those parts. So for example, I wanted to do this little video last week, but I'm going through Effudex, which is a kind of uh, special treatment for the skin to stop it breaking out in skin cancer, because I live in Australia and I've got a very fair skin. And as a result of this, my face kind of started to blister and I still got a few blisters on my lips at the moment, but um, last week I definitely was not going to do this video because my sense of me, myself and I was affected by blisters on my skin. It's kind of weird when you think about it, it's a very small aspect of my body, but that affected the way that I thought about myself. Uh, my, my view of myself and all our views of all ourselves are constantly shifting dependent on parts, including something as small as a few inches, a few square inches of skin. We're also dependent on causes. Um, and once again, um, uh, about a week, about a month ago, I would have said that I'm very robust and healthy and fit. Uh, but then I've been away on a trip and I haven't been to the gym and I, I, I returned to the gym and I can't push the same amount of weight. It's a real struggle. I've got to decrease my reps. My view of who I am has shifted because of the causes. I'm not keeping up my normal gym routine. And we all know if we start to eat unhealthily or we do various things physically and or mentally, our view of ourselves changes. So instead of there being some permanent, self-existent, isolated, separate thing, our sense of self is profoundly affected by different causes. And last, but by no means least, in fact, probably the most important, one sense of self is constantly changing according to our own mind's engagement. Uh, my sense of who I am can change depending on a single conversation on a, on a phone or a message. I mean, of course, I'm less affected by these things now than I used to be uh, because of all kinds of mind training and understanding, etc. But it's really interesting to watch one's own mind and see how your sense of self is affected by all these different inputs. And fascinatingly, we still use the same label of me, myself, or I, or our name, David Mickey. I mean, I was brought up as a steak-eating Presbyterian in the middle of Africa, and now I am a vegetarian Buddhist who lives in Australia, and yet, without any sense of hypocrisy on my part, I still feel I'm the same me, myself, or I, and I'm still called David Mickey. I'm still using the same label on a continuum of body and mind, which is constantly shifting. It's really quite fascinating when you think about it like that. And interestingly also, this, how do other people think about me? I mean, I know for a fact that there are some people who wouldn't have a good word to say about me. Um, I could give you their names, but I won't. <laughs> and there are other people who would speak about me in the most glowing terms. So who is right? Now I would have a different view again. So it's all very much dependent on the mind that is doing the participation or the, the mind that is projecting this view of who the being is for how they exist. So we all exist in dependence on parts, on causes, and on mind's projection. Um, the most commonly held view of me, myself, and I out there among people who don't know any better is that I exist as a kind of controller or owner or possessor of uh, mind and body. Um, but when you think about it, that, that, that kind of logic, if you want to call it that, doesn't actually work. Because if I was indeed separate and independent from body and mind, that would mean that you could take yourself off on a self-development course for a weekend and learn all sorts of really useful and powerful things to do with your mind, but yourself would be unaffected by it because it's separate from your mind. It would also mean that you had a, if you had a terrible accident and became, say, paralyzed, your sense of self was, would also be completely unaffected because, well, that's just a body, that's, that's not me, I'm, I'm separate from that. So when we look for a self-dependent, uh, sorry, a self-existent, an inherently existent, a separate I, I'm just giving you a few synonyms here because I want to mention them, or an I who exists from his own side, we can't in fact find such a being. All that we can find is a collection of parts, of causes, which we um, impute with our mind and which changes according to um, how we're projecting or how we're involved or engaged with that thing. So what are the implications of this, uh, the sense of I? Some people feel a bit kind of horrified and think, are you saying that I don't actually have a soul? That I don't have a, an authentic or real me? Well, no, that's not what being has said at all. Um, it's the way, it's how things exist that we're looking at. And what we're saying is that all things, myself included, are a dependent arising. I am a 
the conventional eye is a dependent arising. In Buddhism, we have two different eyes. Uh, there's the true eye and the false eye. Uh, the false eye is some separately existent, independently existent, inherently existent eye um, that has no dependence on, on anything, body or mind. And the true eye is just a label for this uh, collection of parts, causes and minds imputation. Sometimes we call this dependent arising the conventional eye. And what's so wonderful about this conventional eye is that we can drive it in any direction we like. In fact, we're already doing so, it's just we're not necessarily aware that that is the process that we're engaged in. Because this eye is constantly changing, because you have full control, or quite a lot of control, over uh, our physical and mental trajectory, we can choose to cultivate the causes that will take it in a particular direction so that we will experience the effects at a later point. We have, if we wish, the opportunity uh, to create the causes for this conventional eye to experience nirvana and even full and complete and perfect enlightenment. So, in fact, the, the discovery that there is no self-existent self or independently or inherently existent I, me, myself, is a wonderful discover discovery because it means that change is indeed possible. In fact, change is the only thing that's happening all the time. And if we wish, we can create and cultivate the causes to experience complete and perfect enlightenment in the future, not only for our own benefit, but for the benefit of everyone else around us. I hope you've enjoyed this very, very brief introduction to the concept of Shunyata.